Hey, I want to welcome you. If you are newer here, my name is Scott. I'm one of the pastors here. And over the last couple of weeks, we've been on a journey uh, in a series called Good Homes. And the whole idea and the desire behind this has been that for all of us, that we would maybe discover the fullness of what it means uh, to live out our walk with Christ, to live that out in relationship, what our homes would look like, our marriages, our relationships, our parenting, all these different things. What does God have to say about these things? And that's been the goal and the aim. And last week, uh, our main text that we looked at was Revelation chapter three. And today I want us to go back to the very beginning. It's the first book in the Bible, so it's quick to find. If you have your Bible, open up Genesis chapter one, verse one. If you don't, um, I wanna encourage you also with this. Our team has been thoughtful. They prayed over it. It's been carefully crafted. There's this handout that you received on your way in kind of looks like a magazine. Um, You can have the text in there, but also uh, it's an encouragement and a challenge in your own journey throughout the week that you could use it uh, for your home, for your relationship. So Genesis chapter one, verse one, we enter in. For some of us, we might know this one by heart. It just goes as simple as this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And right away, we are introduced into the creation story, what over decades people will argue about, will search and try to discover using history, using science, using, using uh, human reasoning, all these different things to search for. How did we get to be here today? And from the very beginning, God gives us this answer. In the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. That for many of us, if we just do the work of studying and using science and all the different things, we argue over the course of millions of years, maybe somehow we came to be today where you and I would exist and somehow have human reasoning and understanding and all these different ideas and it just came from happenstance, but it goes and it begs the question from human reasoning alone, how can something come from nothing? And God gives us that answer. For all of us, we even just know like there has to be some intelligent design for us to be here, for our hearts to beat the way they do, for us to breathe in the way that we do, for all these different things, how can it be? And God gives us this answer, but through the rest of this chapter, over and over again, we're told the creation story, that God had thought and he, he, he had plans for what it could be that he creates the day and the night and he separates them and he says it is good, that he creates animals of the the air of the sea and of the land and he says it's good. That good word is tov. What it means is uh, to be like, if you will, perfect. For many of us, we use good in such a simple way, right? There's this new Netflix series you should check out. It's really good. Like some of us lie about it. We're like the Dallas Cowboys, they're really good. Like they ain't good. Sorry, I had to. It's been decades since you guys have done anything of worth. All right, moving on. But we, we use this word good in such a simple way, but when God says it, he doesn't say it as some just simple meaningless. He's saying it is perfect. It has been thoughtful and it is excellent throughout this process. But if you continue in that same, Genesis chapter one, if we continue, it talks about all the different things of creation, but then it gets to, in verse 27, it says, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. That word blessed is significant. It has meaning. It's not just some small statement. He blesses them. And he says, be fruitful and multiply. Now with the day and age that we live in, we have separated sex and reproduction because of contraceptives. But back then when you would say that statement, it was a clear statement of intimacy between man and woman, sex. He, he would say, it is good as well. It is tov, it is excellent. It is from his creation. For many of us, it's even hard to discuss in church because over the course of time or how churches have handled it, they, they don't wanna talk about it. Just don't do it. Don't look at it. Don't act like it. Don't, don't tell anyone you're doing it. We don't know how all the kids got here. They just got here. Don't say anything. And we've fallen for this lie that God creates it. He says it is tov. It's his creation. We've allowed culture to manipulate what God created. And he says it with this value with this importance and he says be fruitful and multiply the first command God ever gives for many of us we think that religion is often about what you're not supposed to do for some of us we're like man 
I really don't want to become that Christian because then like we can't do anything fun. We can't, we're boring. Like whatever it looks like. But the first command God gives is not a command of what not to do. It's a command of what to do. For some of you, you're like, I'm, I, I'm with that God thing now. Page one, he's got me. Like this is his command to his people. Be fruitful and multiply. That it means so much more than just the physical. It's the relational, it's the intimacy, it's all this. And he gives this command to his people right here. For some of us, we've fallen for the lies or maybe we've contributed to them. We don't wanna talk about this topic. Maybe for some of us, we're so uncomfortable with it. And maybe for many of us, we need to get a little more uncomfortable. Maybe right now, you need to look to the person next to you. Look to the person next to you and tell them sex is good. Don't really do that, that's weird. (laughs) Weirdos. You guys are... (laughs) Don't walk around and tell people that. But... Can I tell you this? I really do believe this, especially for the Christians. We've fallen for a lie and we we hide from conversations that need to be had. We've allowed culture to dictate and determine what really is what. When God speaks of it, he creates it and he has a plan for it. For some of us parents, you need to have real authentic conversations with your kids. You're letting their friends tell them about this topic instead of you telling them the truth. And their friends are dumb. You need to speak truth to them. You need to get uncomfortable. You need to get awkward. I love getting awkward and having those conversations. I like talking about the elephant in the room. Like if you and I know each other, we do life together, I know I can trust you. Like up here, I have to fight to have a filter. Like my, like my brain wants to say a lot of things that I, I go, nope, not the time. Like you don't know me yet. You might say I'm bad. Um, but the truth is you need to sit and have a real conversation with your kids. And you might be like, they're too young. Can I tell you? They might not be. They're hearing this information all over the place and God speaks truth and he says what it really is and how valuable it really is and we've left it to the wayside and our culture is taking it and speaking about it and they're manipulating it. This is what God creates and he says it is good. The reason that for many of us it's a struggle or a tension also is this just reality, this tension of life, uh, what we call the flesh and the spirit. That because of sin entering the world, because of free will, that you and I could have a choice and that often we choose the wrong things. We have manipulated it and we've messed it up and we have this tension in life of flesh and spirit. Flesh is the animalistic desires, the immediate gratification, do what I want, when I want, however, it's porn, it's tinder, it's all this trash in our life. And the spirit is this calling for us to something greater, the fullness of God, but it also is in us actually letting, pushing down, if you will, our flesh to say, I want something more. It's, it's like you and I, and probably all of us to some level have said we want to uh, be healthy. We wanna eat healthier. I wanna, I wanna be a little more healthy with my eating habits. But right now, as I'm talking about eating, your stomach is starting to turn and you're thinking right now about a hamburger the size of my head and French fries in a bag the size of my torso and that cheese just slowly melting down each patty and the grilled onions to perfection. The toasted bun with the sesame seeds just flaking off. Here's the thing, you and I want to be healthy, but in that moment, we're thinking about eating the worst thing for us. It's, it's the same with the gym, right? For many of us, we want to be fit. We want to be a little more uh, uh, healthy. We want to go work out. We want to create some habits that are good for us. And so we set our alarm. We have every intention to wake up, but when that s- alarm goes off, we hit snooze because what in that moment, we just deserve a little more sleep. It's, it's this on a much grander scale. There are these smaller desires, not always bad, but then there are the greater desires that we would, how do we yearn and go after those? For many of us, it's in discovering how God created it. He says it's tov, it's good, it's excellent, but also understanding he created it in a, in a package, if you will, a container called marriage. That is not what our government gives. It is what God gave to us, and he calls it a covenantal commitment. It's like a small glimpse of the commitment God gave to us. That's what marriage is. The commitment of saying no matter, for better or for worse, for all this stuff, it's it's a small picture of actually the commitment God has given to us, his covenant to us, that he would provide a way, that he would keep that relationship with us for better or for worse. 
And it's in even discovering in marriage that there's this fullness of discovering and being a man or a woman that we would discover this to its fullness, that we would see even in our vulnerabilities it can be met in our marriage and not manipulated outside of that, that, that it's in our marriage that we would have that support that no matter what man says, I know my spouse is there to speak truth and love to me. It's in this, it's, it's men, you need to, you need to be there for your wife. It's not a transaction. You need to invest in that relationship. And women, what your man needs most, but he's so scared to say it because it sounds so weak, is he just wants to know that what he's doing is actually making a difference. Like the, it's in marriage that we discover all this. It's in this relationship and intimacy that all this is discovered and it's blessed. But here's the thing, Jesus also has a, a say in this. He has a say in Matthew, it's one of the most famous, this is where we're gonna spend the rest of our time, Matthew chapter five, you can open there, verse 27. It's a famous message Jesus gives, it's known as the Sermon on the Mount. A sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon ever, and Jesus, when he speaks, you gotta understand, for many of us, it doesn't have the same like meaning in the moment if we don't really take it all into context. When Jesus spoke, it was crazy. It was transformative, what he was saying compared to what everyone else was saying before him. And he speaks to all these different issues, and one of them is found in verse 27, and he says this, you have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. Now right away what he does is he's referring back to even how they would just live their lives. For them they would not have Bibles in their hands in their homes. They would go to the local temple. They would open up a scroll. Each book of the Bible in here would be a different scroll. The rabbi would bring it out. He would lay it before them. He would read a portion of the scroll and then he would give what is called the interpretation. It'd be some version of you and I today. We read the word of God and there's some form of interpretation. What does it mean for us? this would happen so every time that they would come in they were growing up in the temple and they would hear from the rabbi all the time and one of those Exodus chapter 20 it speaks of the 10 commandments one of those commandments do not commit adultery so Jesus refers back to the Old Testament and he says hey you've you may have heard of this before but he continues and he says but I say which is crazy in itself and he says Anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than the whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Jesus just lays it down. This would be crazy statement. Their whole life they hear, do not commit adultery. Jesus says, hey, commit adultery, yeah, that's wrong. But even worse is this, what you start in your heart. And he starts to lay this out. Now some of us, real quick, what you need to understand is uh, there's different texts in the Bible. There's historical documentation. There's prophetic language that speaks of a time to come. There's metaphor, there's parables. And even here, Jesus gives a little hyperbole. He is not actually recommending for you to cut off your arm, gouge out your eye. He is speaking of the soul issue that it erodes your soul. It ruins you. It'll lead you places that you don't wanna go, that is bad for you, that is bad for your marriage, that is bad for your home. It's not good. This is how important important it is this is how vital it is to get it figured out this is the language that Jesus gives it's it's crazy when you think about it like Jesus sometimes we think of Jesus he, he comes on and he's just like hey I love you all you're good we're good let's go like and you just leave it alone but you you gotta Jesus actually calls us to a higher standard not a lower one and that's even the craziness of when you look at the text and you look at the, 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 the statements from Jesus. He calls us to this high standard, but we're also told that he says this to us. He says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And that only leads us into like, what is he skidding to? What is he speaking about? And I, I think it's a picture of, of our lives lived on our own or our lives lived in surrender and actually trusting God to lead. That's where that dichotomy comes. 
So Jesus gives this crazy language. He speaks of this and, and it all connects to, but, but I think what's, what's interesting is when Jesus does this, I think it has a greater purpose that sometimes we take for granted. Like when Jesus calls us to this higher standard, hey, not just the commitment of adultery, but actually just what you're looking at, what you're allowing into your mind, your heart, your soul. Like that's a problem. And, and I think when he, when he does that, he's calling us to, to a life that actually deals with a, a more difficult, it's harder, right? Nowadays, more than ever, we're, we're bombarded by imagery and different things, and every TV show we love also has all the bad stuff in it, like all this stuff that can corrupt, that can mess with us, and all this. So it's more difficult to live in this way that Jesus calls us to this standard. So it gets hard, it gets difficult, but I think in that difficulty is actually where uh, we become stronger, like there's this, uh, this book that I, I came across called The Comfort Crisis. It's a sociologist, he's not religious at all, um, but he, he, he begins to explain this issue that he, he began to discover in our own culture. As life gets easier, um, as, as things are not as difficult for us, it actually is causing a problem for us also. That we, we, we've fallen into a comfort crisis. He, he explains his premise really is this. Uh, when, when people are facing difficulties, tension in life, they are physically stronger, mentally stronger, and even spiritually stronger. And that we've gotten so comfortable and it actually caused us to get weaker. And I think even in this, when Jesus calls us to this higher standard, it's because he's looking at all the religious people that give all the different rules. They're like, hey, you can only worship at this place or do this or all this. And he, he, but he sees still a heart issue that is corrupted within those people. So he's calling them to something more, that they would actually surrender all of them and actually experience the fullness of following Christ. A stat in that book said uh, 80% of Americans will experience back pain at some point in their life. For some of you right now, you're sitting with back pain. You're like, how long until you're over, dude? I'm, I'm done. Um, for some of us, we've experienced back pain before. For others, you will one day, 80% of you at least. And the interesting thing is though, out of that 80% that experience back pain, then it explains this. It says that out of that 80, 85% are what are called um, like nonspecific back pain. What that means is they didn't get it from like a injury in a car accident or something. It just came about somehow through how they lived. And, and what research begins to show, it's just how we live our lives. It's all of us, all we do all day is we either sit, we stand, or we lie down. And actually that movement has led to problems in your own body. Your body is meant to actually put, be put under more tension that maybe we're actually doing. We went from hunters and gatherers to people that open up their phone and order Grubhub on their phone and then you have to suffer. It's so difficult, 15 minutes until you get your food. Like we've gone so far to comfort and it actually leads to problems. And I think even here, Jesus saw a problem with the religious people that thought they were doing everything right but they were missing it completely and he says, no, it's the heart that matters. The heart from everything, the heart, everything else flows. You know, I, I've always struggled to put like, if you will, my philosophy of ministry to words, to language, because my approach might be different than others. But for me, it's been, it's been this tension, but th through this, this text, through this week, it's become a little more clear that I'm not saying anything bad about it, but there are some that might preach more about like, this is what you do, this is what you don't do. Do, don't do, do, don't do. And there's some truth to that for sure. There's even God's word that gives us benefits. And there's logical reasoning on why we would or wouldn't do things that actually benefit not just us, but others around us, our home, our marriage, all these different things. But for me, it's, it's come to this point of my desire is not just to tell you what is right or not right because you could do a lot of right things but still be wrong internally. Like people can act right but not be right. So then it's like, man, how do we fix that thing? Because it seems like from the heart, from the soul, from your, your mind, everything else flows out. So if we could get that sorted, then, then maybe our actions begin to look more right. And by right, what I mean is beneficial, not just for us, but for others as well. And I think this is a version of what Jesus speaks to in this. He's like, hey, all of you, they're, they're all religious. They all grew up with it. They heard everything about it. And he's stopping and he's going, hey, 
You've heard it said over and over again, but I say, and he leads them down this road that for all of them would be crazy. Like that's difficult. For most of us too, we could recognize that's difficult. Every thought you've had about someone, every image that you've taken in, every action that you've committed, how it corrupts your soul, how it messes with your mind, and it can divide a home. That's how important it is. Jesus speaks to this issue. He he speaks of the importance and also the standard as Christians, this is the standard we're called to. Not just to act right, not when you get on campus, then you're like, oh, I'm not gonna cuss anymore, but then tomorrow you will again. Like, what is that? Like, Jesus, that's dumb. Like, he, he cares about the heart of what happens your day in, your day out, everything about us. He speaks to this issue, and I think it has importance for us. And the interesting thing is sometimes we'll read the text and we'll see the problem they had, but we'll think that we've somehow overcome it over time. Can I tell you, we're no better or worse than they were back then. It looks a little different, but it's the same issue. We look at them and we're like, they're crazy, dude. Have you ever read the Old Testament? Like, every guy was married to like 12 women. Like, how savages, barbarians, they're crazy. We would never do that, although that's a growing trend in our society lately. But that, then we also, like, just so we make sure we understand, even with something like that, like polygamy, like, it was, it was never approved of by God. The people went and acted out in dumb ways and God in his grace still used us just like he uses you today. Even in your dumb, stupid ways, he still chooses to use you and he says, I'm gonna do great things in you, but it it doesn't start there. Like he, he doesn't approve of just because it's recorded of in the scripture. And it continues though, it's, it's in all these different other areas. Um, It's in, back then they had this almost like approval, especially for the men, because they had horrible standards back then between men and women, but for the men, it was almost approved of if your spouse cheats, then you can cheat. It's okay, it's not committing adultery. And for us, many of us today, we kind of do the same thing, get your revenge, like, like, or just hold it over them, lord it over them, the rest of your relationship, and continue to bring it up. Like all this problem, we can see it's still the same problem today. There's a city in back then called Corinth, and every city, if you will, had idols they worshiped. They chose like one, if you will, that they became like the representative of. And in Corinth, it was known as the sex god. And they had a temple, and in the temple were prostitutes, and this is how you would worship the sex god. And it, it got into just ridiculous, and, and they would actually then term that language if you lived sexually immoral life, they would call it Corinth size. So it would be this term. It would be like our modern day, what happens in Vegas stays in blah, like stupid. Like, what are we doing? Like, we fall for these lies. We, we act like we're so much different or so much better, but we're still the same problem because why? Our actions might look slightly different, but our souls are still eroding and this is what Jesus comes for he doesn't come for you to act right some of you need to hear that today because you you felt like man I, I, I want this whole like Jesus thing but I gotta get my life right like you already have it wrong some of you are like, like, man, I, I follow Jesus, I chose him, like I want him more, I want my life to be better, I want all this stuff, but my life doesn't always look better, my actions aren't always better, things around me aren't always better, and it's like, no, because you're still looking at the wrong thing. He came for your heart. He came for something deeper, something that actually changes everything else. In our society today, they say that a, uh, sexualized content, um, you, you experience sexualized content every 10 minutes. For some of you, you're like, I'm 20. Like that means the person next to you is maybe two. Like all the time bombarded. Your phone, TV, billboards, different things, all different things that just bombard us with this content in our life. The crazy thing is for some of us, we think that Christians are immune to this. Like we have the out. But here's the truth. If you're a good Christian, or an adamant atheist, we have the same problem. Divorce, porn, adultery, pretty much equal across the board, no matter where you're at in your spirituality. That's what they say. People in the church struggle with it just as much as people outside of it. Why? Because all we're doing is trying to fix exterior right actions instead of an interior problem. This is what Jesus came for. 
like don't, if you're newer to your faith, like don't, don't just try to look like someone else. Like actually allow Jesus to work in you. He'll make it look right. Our homes aren't meant to just be good homes. They're tove homes. They're excellent homes. He has a plan for them. He can bless them. He can use them. Our parenting can be a blessing to the next generation and the next generation to that generation and it'll be a blessing that will transform homes, transform lives, transform churches, but it starts in the heart. That's what Jesus came for. And so many of us have it so wrong where we, we're just trying to look right. Like we're posers. That's, that, I think that's language my generation used. I was a poser. I tried to skate. I wasn't a skater. I just had a skateboard. And they were like, do a kickflip. And I'm like, no. Be- I'm busy. Like, I have stuff to do. Like, but that's what we're doing with our faith also. We're just posers. We're just trying to look right. For many of us, we walk in the church and we're like, hey, how are you? Mm, blessed. Like, good day. Mm. Like, you don't talk like that. But we, we just do that. We're we're not ever doing life with other people and actually sharing our struggles. And what we do is we just cover up and we, we think that we're okay, but there's a deeper problem that Jesus comes for and he speaks to. And I, I believe today, maybe for many of us, it's the struggle is when we talk about this topic, especially intimacy, sex. Like the problem is that that carries a lot of burden and baggage in our life. Because I can tell you, like, I really do believe that God has a, a plan and he has a call and he says that this is the best way to experience this because he says it's tov, it's good, it's excellent. But he also gives it in a container that says this is how you can experience the blessing of it and we have corrupted that and messed that up. And I can tell you all that and you can walk out of here and still feel that baggage and, and, and burden upon you. But I, I need you to also hear this, that, that whatever your past is, Whatever divorce, adultery that you've experienced or committed, whatever, whatever struggles, whatever imagery that you're con- constantly just intaking, whatever that looks like, whatever abuse has happened in your past, whatever it might be, that God has come and he has paid that price. Amen. And that's the craziness of the grace of Jesus. Because whatever your past is, he pays for it. And he calls us to a higher standard, but that higher standard is a calling that he calls us to and he takes care of the rest. It's not something you just achieve on your own, but it's where you start. It's that foundation. For some of us, you just need to actually come to this. If you believe Jesus for who he really is, that God would come in human form because he saw the division between sin and him. And sin is evil, it's corrupt, it's everything that God is not. That he would pay that price so that you could be reconciled, you. He didn't do like some group effort, he came for you. That he would pay that price. And no matter what baggage you've had at once, it's been paid for, it's been dealt with. And if you would come to know that, choose that, then you would discover this that Jesus died and he rose again to pay that price and to reconcile the entire universe. Not, not, just, not just this church, not just this city or, or nation or world, but he will redeem and reconcile all things. And if you believe that, and then all we're called to is to repent. Repent is such a churchy word. What it means is to turn away and turn to Jesus. That's what it means. Turn away. Turn away from what you've just gotten such in the habit of doing and acting like. Turn away from how you once thought marriages and relationship should look like. Turn away from making sure that you always get the final say in that argument. Turn away from from these uncomfortable conversations and you just hide from them and turn to Jesus. And he says, through the power of Jesus, all things will be redeemed. That you will experience a strength to overcome and to get through and to face every challenge in your home and it's through the power of Jesus. My hope is this for, for, for you today. Christians, that you see this and you see what God created and it is good, but it doesn't stop there. Jesus calls you to a higher standard. You've gotten comfortable. You've gotten convenient about your Christianity. He calls you to a higher standard. 
that it's no longer your own ability and what's convenient, but it's finally surrendering and saying, God, you have every bit of me because that's what he came for. For some of you today, maybe you, you, you walk around so burdened and you feel like your life is the mess and everyone else seems to have it figured out and you're walking around with regrets in a past. We all are. We are imperfect, but because of Christ, he redeems and reconciles. For some of you today, especially on this topic, you can feel like so much has been done before that you are just so regretful of or you, you just carry that baggage and you feel like you can never get through it or overcome it or be redeemed or your marriage is forever irreconcilable and all of these issues. And just for a moment, maybe you would discover through Jesus, all things are possible. He redeems all things. And it's when you turn and turn to him. If you do me a favor, just bow your head and close your eyes. You know, Jesus, he, in this moment, he, he makes it so clear for us. It's not just about how you act, but it's what happens on the inside. It's the soul. For us Christians, maybe this is a moment where we need to say, God, I want you to go deeper God, I want you to search my soul. Maybe shine a light on an area that I've gotten so comfortable and, and just lackadaisical with. And maybe, God, you would reveal to me that you still are doing a work in me and you're calling me to a higher standard. And God, I give that to you. For some of us, maybe our walk with Jesus has yet started. But maybe today is the day where you can discover the amazing grace of Jesus that redeems and reconciles all things and that that spirit of God dwells within each of us, gives us the strength, the courage, and even the conviction when needed to overcome everything before us. For you, maybe that's a decision that will happen today. How do you experience the power, the saving power of Jesus? Repent. Turn away, turn to. If that's you today, I just want to encourage you. Maybe it's just a moment where you just look up, make eye contact with me. Maybe that's the moment where you're making a decision. Maybe it's a moment where in your own soul and heart, you're committing that you're, you're giving everything to Jesus. You recognize him as your Lord and Savior. For all of us right now, I encourage you through the power of Jesus he redeems and he does all things Heavenly Father God I pray for each of us today I pray for all of us no matter where we are you know exactly where we are you know the immediate struggle and difficulty that we face God you know you know that the tension within our own homes and God you call us and you say man I want to continue a work in you I call every one of us to a higher standard, but I want to continue that work, that your home would be blessed, that your, your, your marriage would be blessed, that your, your, your parenting would be blessed, that your workplace would be blessed, and God, you put this upon us, and you say, I have great plans for you. I'm continuing a work in you, and God, we just pause, we receive, and we discover the first thing that you call us to is this, our hearts. God, that you would have every part of me. God, that you would lead and guide me. There is nothing else that matters, God, if you don't matter first. God, I pray that we'd be a people that let you lead us and guide us. God, that we would yearn to go deeper with you, that you would guide us and direct us in every area of our life because we would continue to keep you the central focus of our life. God, that we would have Tov homes, Tov marriages. And God, it is all because of your amazing work, your saving power, your amazing grace. And it's in the name of Jesus we say, amen. Hey guys, I really hope this message was uh, encouraging to you today. 
That's right, my wife and I are so honored that you joined us in this way. And we'd love to encourage you. Uh, it, one, if you'd like to connect with us more, uh, if you live locally, and uh, we'd love to have you visit us in person. If you'd like to join us in the mission here and uh, partner with us, uh, we'd love for you to receive all of that and even other messages, and you can find all that at this resource right here. Thank you so much for joining us.